Welcome to the second episode of this Device to Cloud series here on Subscribe. Um, today we're going to talk about patterns um, of uh, Device to Cloud communication and we're going to start diving into the first of those patterns. Um, and uh, we're going to spend a few episodes on uh, you know, figuring out how to do that particular thing right. Um, but let's talk about the patterns first. I have four patterns which I believe are representing a fairly exhaustive set um, of uh, how to communicate between devices and the cloud. Um, the first one is telemetry, information flowing from a device to other systems for conveying status of the device and its environment. That is data that the device volunteers out of its own functionality. And it might be something that is a simple temperature reading, which is conveyed every minute or several times um, a second, or even you know just every hour or every day. Um, or it might be something that is a more complex sensor reading, a photo, even a video stream, that's being pushed down in a one-way fashion from the device into processing systems, which might be picked up by one processing system, which might be picked up by many processing systems, depending on how, what you want to do, and then also might be evaluated immediately or might be evaluated later down the road and might be stored and then evaluated in the context of something like big data. Um, inquiries is something that the device needs right now for its functionality, to realize its functionality. So the joke example that I'm using for that is uh, the internet connected toaster, which you turn on, put in a toast in the morning. And uh, one of the fun wonderful functionalities of that thing is it toasts the weather, a cloud or a sun onto, or a snowflake onto the toast. Of course, the device doesn't know that. So it doesn't know what the weather forecast is. So it inquires with a remote system for what the weather is going to be likely. And then we'll go and execute that based on that information. So anytime the device needs to have some outside information that it can't possibly know, it starts an inquiry and then gets a response. That response might be sent and retrieved immediately with little latency, or it might be something that takes a little bit longer to inquire. So there's no implication on, you know, immediate REST response as an HTTP. It might be something if you have a bi-directional protocol that you may want to send, and then it may take a minute even um, to go and fulfill it even longer. Command is exactly the opposite or opposite side, opposite way around. Um, you have a service on um, in the cloud, or you have a control system that sits on the factory floor, or um, in city hall, if we're talking about smart cities, and that wants to go and actuate something. It wants to turn on all the street lights, or it wants to go and uh, uh, change configuration values in a machine. That's a command that requires action, physical action or reconfiguration of the device. Let's say um, you're getting some telemetry data that is reason for concern some machine readings, you know, value readings that you get, the machine runs too hot, you wanna go in and uh, turn on a higher fidelity telemetry st stream to investigate that further, or you have a photo and the photo has, uh, um, and a security camera and has some reason for concern, um, then uh, you, or you, the, the motion center gives you something, you may wanna go and turn that camera on to higher uh, frame rate. So that's a command, something that requires immediate action that's initiated uh, by demand of a control system, which might be the cloud system. And then you have notifications. It's the opposite um, of uh, telemetry, where you have data that's existing in the world, telemetry in the world that is being told to that device because the device is interested in it or should be interested in it. Um, let's ha say you have a navigation system in a car that wants to know about the traffic conditions. Let's say you have a wind park uh, the wind park wants to know about the upcoming weather conditions um, for all kinds of safety reasons. Um, and uh, so information that's being conveyed to the devices. Um, none of these patterns imply a particular um, assurance about delivery. They might be the delivery insurance assurance might be best effort or lossy even um, in the case certainly of telemetry, which is sent every second. Loss is usually OK for some messages. Uh, with notifications, that might also be the case. Some of those things are critical, so you need to have um, higher assurances, and that is independent of the pattern. Really, you can have notifications which require um, high reliability, but even without um, you know immediate feedback that you want to go and process. A notification is a one-way thing where the device decides whether it wants to act. A command is something where someone has decided, decided that the device ought to act, and so that's the difference, and then you want to go and have some feedback um, based 
on this. So this, I believe, is a fairly exhaustive set. Oh, by the way, notifications obviously could also be a video stream, an audio stream that the device ought to um, sound off. Um, that is, again, um, as with telemetry, you know, whether it's one byte or whether it's a stream of bytes, it doesn't change, really change fundamentally what that basic pattern is. We're going to start homing in this episode and the coming episodes specifically on the hardest one, and that is uh, commands, and we're going to go and investigate all the other ones um, down the road. To implement commands, what I've done is um, I have um, taken the little the Arduino that I have. Let's go and find this here. Um, and um, so here's Visual Studio. I took the Visual Micro IDE plugin for Arduino. Um, you could certainly also use for this little example the standard Arduino IDE if you have an Arduino and uh, implemented a web server on it using the um, webserver.h here that is actually the Webduino library built by these guys. And uh, you can get that from GitHub um, if you want to have a library like this for the Arduino. And um, so I'm, what I'm doing is uh, fairly simple. Let's go and start at the bottom of this. Um, I have uh, the setup function uh, where I start uh, uh, configuring the diagnostics here. And then I start the Ethernet library telling it the MAC address and also the IP address. Um, in this example, I'm telling it the IP address because I need to know it to switch it. I need to you know, know the name of the device in the end on the network so I can go and address it and I can go and do something with it. So what, the way I'm solving this here is very simply by giving it a direct IP address. Uh, 192.168.2.107 as we'll see uh, in, a little, in a little moment. Then I'm configuring the LED pin, that's pin 9 here on my Ethernet Arduino. I'm going to turn the LED on and uh, off after 500 milliseconds just to see, have visual feedback that uh, the device has actually loaded that program. And then we're going to set this default command, which is a callback, and that's being called for every HTTP request that comes in. And we're going to start um, listening. And then in the loop, um, the way the library does that is it process connection, and that's a non-blocking call uh, that happens um, every time that loops through. So the Arduino can actually go and do its actual job, which we currently don't have one. Um, that's uh, particular here. So as a request comes in, this is being called. Um, I have a, um, I only react on put. I consider this a resource, the LED a resource. I'm changing its state using a put. Um, and uh, so I'm parsing out the next parameter. You see that this, I'm doing this on the stack here. So a lot of the people who are writing server software are not gonna go and freak out already why I'm not, why I'm putting this on the stack. Well. Um, because that's how you do if you only have two, two, kilobytes, of, uh, two kilobytes of RAM. Um, and uh, there's some safeguards here. You actually go and tell the name, the size of the name, and the library is, uh, knows about overflows. Um, so I'm only going to proceed if uh, the parameter is okay. Um, if it's not okay, then I'm going to go break out. And then I'm looking for specifically for the library um, that is... Uh, for the uh, for the parameter, sorry, it's called state, and if that's true, one that we're going to turn the LED on and going to set the pin to signaled, and uh, otherwise I'm going to turn it not to signaled. And if I can't find my parameter or if it's not a put, then um, I'm going to go and fail out. So that's pretty much all that is to that there is to that program. Here's the IP address that I set fixed, and uh, so I'm going to go and load this onto my Arduino. I can see. Um, on the board that uh, it will now when the program is there there it went so it's uh, flashing that LED the program is now there uh, and now I'm going to go into Fiddler I'm going to turn this on 102.168.2.107 port 8088 execute wonderful LED is on let's go and turn this off LED is off brilliant this here is uh, my machine in Redmond that sits under my colleague Abhishek's desk. That is my machine that I have over there. And uh, I configure the IP address of the house um, in um, the host file because I don't want to tell you the IP address of my house. So it's uh, called house. And uh, so I'm coming from Redmond. And now I'm going to turn the LED on. 
And I'm going to turn the LED off again. No surprise. False. And the LED's off. The way I did this, obviously, is I manipulated my firewall. So I took my LAN, my wireless LAN hub, and used the port mapping feature of the wireless LAN hub, and then mapped, opened up a hole in the firewall on port 8088, and then mapped that through to the device, knowing what the device's name is. So let's take a look at a diagram of this, of what I just did. In absence, of any kind of security on the device because fitting TLS, transport layer security, HTTPS, onto that device is a complete impossibility due to the weight of the TLS stack. Um, I am exposing that device onto the network, which is, you know, absent all the security encryption signature, all those things, is already a fairly crazy thing. But I'm going to do this anyway, so, and this is how I'm doing it. I go and take the device which is sitting on my network, has a known, locally addressable, well-known name, and have wired this up to my router. So now there's a fixed one-on-one -on -one relationship between that port and that device. And I've configured, instead of using dynamic DNS, which I also have set up, and I'm not gonna tell you the name either, um, I have um, set up this as home on the client, which, and the client that we just saw for remote switching was my machine, in Redmond. So that now actuated the LED by coming in with a request, went to the uh, router here, that connection gets patched through, and that can now go and switch that device. It's fairly, it's, it's low tech, effectively, on the networking. And I'm using, as you see, um, IPv4, IPv4 NAT technology. It's a fairly straightforward thing. Again, there is no security whatsoever. That has some implications. So first of all, let's say, Let's talk about the security of this. Um, I, anybody can come in unauthenticated. Um, everybody can spy on that traffic. Everybody can see that traffic. Um, and everybody can manipulate that traffic who sits on the route because I can observe it and now I can go and manipulate that traffic on the, uh, as well and the device will never know. So that is, if you were doing this over, let's say a wireless LAN on an airport, pretty crazy. So you shouldn't be doing that. Um, another way, so let's get this out of the way from a security perspective, this is horrific, but also let's say for a moment we had security in place, the device, particularly this chip that I'm using here, the WizNet chip, can do, um, the 5100 can do four concurrent connections, which means a DOS attack on that little device is very simple, make four connections and be very slow and you're done. That device cannot be connected to. Um, so it's effectively taken out because it has, it has no defenses. It is happy uh, to be talking to TCP at all. And also you can go and very easily flood it, take one, uh, take one connection and just send a lot of data into it maliciously um, and just figure out a way how this little library that, they, that those guys build um, can be broken. And uh, knowing uh, the history of web services on the web, I am sure that that's easily breakable. So exposing a little device like this to the net, to the network, so when it listens, is probably not a good idea to start with. Um, one way this is being addressed is by now taking these devices, these sensors and actuators directly onto the network, but intermediating them with local hub devices. So we now have a local hub device, and that ho local hub device is exposed. Uh, in a similar way, so you have a, this thing, and then you talk to the individual devices in the house using different mechanisms even, using wireless, Zigbee, it's one of the protocols, or even through Powerline, um, or a mix of those, and then local hub device goes and talks to those things. Um, that's, that's something that happens, that's for home automation, that's great. Um, if you think about more complex machinery where you have subcomponents which work, um, they, would ha they will have to go and agree on a common way of how communicating through that hub and then communicating out. That's not always easy. But let's stick with this model for a moment. Again, you still have to go and configure um, a port on your edge to go and get to that device if you have many of those hubs. And right now, um, there's no... There's no, I can't see any standardization that, ha that happens that takes place where you have, you know, your 
uh, washer and dryer and uh, your home security system and all those things being you know unified in a way that uh, there would be a common protocol amongst those so you end up with multiple of those hubs and then you still have to go and, and deal with that addressing it and of course now you have to go and configure all the dynamic dns stuff which also or the dns that makes them addressable make them findable from the remote switching which is also not necessarily easy of course the nirvana for all this is uh, that all the devices speak IPv6 or the gateway devices speak IPv6 and then all that NAT mapping and all that stuff goes away. But then still, you still have the problem of making those things directly addressable, which means you have to go and still register them. So there's a, um, there's a whole a pretty large set of concerns that's being uh, evaluated that people are thinking about in the Internet of Things space right now of how to deal with networking and how to actually make those those protocols fit for those small devices and ipv6 this seems to be um, the biggest candidate right now everybody's talking about ipv6 in this space and talking talking about making those devices directly addressable and then having compression protocols for ipv6 because it's a fairly uh, fair, it's bigger than ipv4 but ultimately the problems remain the same in that those devices are not made to be exposed directly on the internet because you can go and overwhelm them very, very easily with traffic even if you don't um, attack them. And then remains the problem of encryption, um, of security, where the current SSL TLS suite is really, really heavy for devices which are very, very constrained. And that's something that we have to keep in mind that if you want to, if you still want to buy, you know, household devices, if you want to buy uh, toys and you're still thinking about, you know, buying them for, for 30, 40, 50 um, dollars or euros or whatever the currency is, um, then uh, those things will have to be cheap and then we'll still have those smaller processors. We can't put a PC into everything. Um, so we'll have to live with that. Um, class of devices, we'll have to go and find a way to go and make them addressable. And right now, the, the TLS stack that we have, the, the SSL TLS stack, is very, very heavy for those devices. So, so much for this episode, which uh, leaves us at not a happy end necessarily, where, yes, we have a device exposed to the internet, but there's a bunch of problems, security, um, and uh, the device getting overwhelmed, the stack's not being built for it. So the question is, how can we solve the problem of command in a different way? Um, and uh, we have some ideas um, as far as cloud connectivity goes, but I'm going to talk about those in the next episode. Until then, bye.